Well, everyone, as more and more news comes in about 10th edition, it looks like we may be seeing Death Stars return to the world of Warhammer 40k. And for some newer gamers, they may have heard the term Death Stars, but not entirely know what that is. In this video today, I want to talk to you about what Death Stars were, the darkest days of Warhammer 40k in 7th edition, and what Death Stars could mean in the game currently moving forward. Welcome back, all my 40k fanatics out there. I'm DJ here with Tim's Nation. If you guys haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do turn on the bell for notifications so you can get notified on more videos such as this one and as well my at least weekly battle reports and other faction-focused videos as uh, more content comes out that I'm able to share with you guys. But with that being said, the title of this video says it all. We're talking about Death Stars. So what is a Death Star? Well, back in the heyday of 40k, when we were looking at just RGTs and the competitive focus wasn't really there, there were units called Death Stars. And what a Death Star would be is all your eggs in one basket. And I feel like that's a fitting analogy with the coming holiday. But yes, all the eggs, one basket, and you put as many points, if not all of them, into one unit that would basically win you the game. Now, in the up until 8th edition, uh, the game was played where you had to play, you basically won and lost at the end of the game. Uh, everything was determined at the end. So having a unit that would cover the battlefield and just not be destroyed and then could separate off at the end of the game and go into table quarters, et cetera, et cetera, could win you the game and honestly not always be that much fun, especially when your opponent's strategy might be hide behind a wall. Uh, Death Star builds pre-7th edition were kind of niche and more fun in a sense of how powerful you could make a single unit with the characters that you attach to them. Uh, some of them would be El were Eldar using their Seer Council. Uh, the Necrons had one with the Royal Court. And one I think one of the very first Death Stars was Blood Angels with Terminators with Storm Shields, Chaplain, and a captain attached to the squad. These units played kind of like uh, an RPG game in an MMO would function. You would have your tank, you would have your DPS, your damage dealing units, and you would have a healer of sorts to be able to either protect you, give you feel no pain, or resurrect guys. Uh, again, these units were all the points that you could possibly get into a single squad, and the rest of your army would be small units that would uh, could move into table quarters late in the game and hide, such as land speeders or other fast-moving units. Uh, you might take a dreadnought, since deploying was back and forth at the time. You could put a dreadnought right at the front of your deployment zone of your table quarter and force your opponent to have to deploy further back. Again, at this time in the game, Games Workshop wasn't as focused on the competitive nature of the game and was working more on fluff. And we had some crazy units and crazy rule interactions during this time frame. Uh, and with the game scoring and ending at the end, as I stated before, if that unit survives, you were able to just win the game. Now, <clears throat> during pre-7th edition, it was still pretty easy for a high-level army and a high-level competitive player to be able to take out a all in all or nothing army such as these Death Stars, uh, especially towards the end of third edition when we got a lot more of the Craft World Codexes. We had the Chaos Codex, which gave a so many different variations of armies. And depending on what headquarters unit you took, you basically unlock a different unit to be able to take, an as, take as troops. Now, at this time during the game, the damage wasn't as heavy. So you could theoretically take these Death Star units and be able to survive just based on the fact that there was less dice being rolling, guns had less shots, and uh, were just all, in all encompassed purposes, there was less damage being done. And I keep saying over and over again, until 7th, until 7th, until 7th, because when we got to 7th, that was the darkest day for Death Stars as far as competitive Warhammer was concerned. So 7th edition 40k. 7th edition Warhammer 40k is, it's some would say, one of the worst editions of Warhammer 40k that we've ever seen. Um, it was, it definitely showed a lot of the 
cracks in the foundation of this game. Um, Warhammer was starting to become more popular as a competitive format. Early on in Warhammer, the internet was in its infancy. So rule updates and uh, Golden Demon Awards and everything that we'd seen would be put into magazines. You wouldn't be able to look stuff up on the internet and research armies and see what was going on. Now that we hit 7th edition, now the internet is starting to become more of a tool that we're using for Warhammer. Scores are starting to be tracked more, and people are able to see different armies, and the concept and term netlist is becoming more common as far as it's concerned with armies in this game. 7th edition showed that there is definitely a want for competitive 40k. There is a want for this this environment, but attention needed to be taken to it. And that's when the ITC started to take over the and give us their own FAQs to pr help protect us from what was considered the pro I would have to say, and I know this may be a biased opinion, uh, the worst psychic power, as far as also the most powerful psychic power that Warhammer has ever seen. And that psychic power is invisibility. Invisibility basically stated that you cast this power onto your unit. And when this power cast it onto the unit, it made them invisible. They could only, the only way you could hit them was on sixes at all, hit them at all, shooting or close combat. And you could not snap fire at them. Now, you have to realize that prior to seventh edition, you could not move and shoot heavy weapons. There may be some units that had the ability, such as Chaos Obliterators and Terminators, for example, that could move and shoot heavy weapons. But as far as a game-wide thing is concerned, you could not move and shoot the heavies at all. And even for a long time, if you had a heavy weapon in a squad, they would all have to shoot at the same unit, which made taking heavy weapons in some units kind of a moot point, since a rocket launcher at couldn't, while a rocket launcher could hit a vehicle, your bolters could not at all. They could not touch it and do any damage to it at all. But regardless of that, the Games Workshop introduced a rule called Snapfire. What Snapfire did was it said, you can now shoot when you move with a heavy weapon, but you can only hit on sixes. However, they gave it a key word, which meant that it stated you may Snapfire with this weapon. The problem with that was, is that in invisibility, it said uh, all units can only snap fire at a squad with invisibility, not just reading needed sixes to hit. And then this jumps over into the next part of the problem, which was you with template weapons. Now, prior to 8th edition, we had these little templates. And in some ways, I miss the templates. And in others, it's a good thing that they're gone. Templates are basically when you would use a flame weapon, um, a rocket launcher, which those are the two I'll cover with this, or a battle cannon, we'll say that one, you would have one of three templates that you could use. A flamer template, which was a cone shape, the small blast template at, I believe, three and a half inch circumference, and the large blast template that was five inch circumference. You would place these down, and based on the rules and how the game played, the units underneath it would take would take the hits based on being underneath it. Now, this was honestly a rules nightmare because a lot of people would say, well, you're touching the base. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. And because people have banners and things on top of their models, it became difficult to hold the template over the model without damaging it and get a clear sight on where they were. And playing in a tournament and both people wanting to win, it could sometimes lead to some field bad moments and some arguments that were really unnecessary in the game. While templates were kind of cool, they were fun, uh, I think the direction of the game with having just a set number of dice or being able to roll dice for it is a better a route that we've gone with it, but there's a part of me that misses the templates because I've played for so long, and I'm sure there's others who do as well. The reason I'm talking about these templates is because when you would snap fire a gun, you were not allowed to use template weapons could never snap fire. So this meant flame weapons, any blast weapons, and there was a lot of those, would not ever be able to shoot at a unit that invisibility was cast on. So at this point, if you look at your army and you look at your codex, Space Marines, for example, and you look at how many weapons have the blast keyword 
or how many weapons do not roll to hit and they just automatically hit with the number of types so shots such as flame weapons those weapons would not be able to hit invisible units and because death stars were so popular in the meta this meant these weapons were just useless and this meant you would not use them now the itc then came back and said gave a faq that tournaments could use and this led to a lot of times where people would sign up for a tournament and the first question would be are you using the itc faq or how are you ruling invisibility? At some point in time, some TOs did not really like some of the uh, ITC's FAQs, and one that they might only adapt was the ruling on invisibility. It was that destructive to the game and that powerful at the same time. So uh, now you take these weapons and they're not able to be used in the game at all. You don't want to take them because you don't know, you don't want to practice, you don't want to make you want to make sure that you're not practicing building a list, painting models and setting stuff up that you're going to run into this death star and just auto lose because you can't hurt anything into it. But that being said, what else was looking into death stars and why were these things able to win? I mean, you're literally putting all your points into one unit. So, um, basically, with the keywords at the time, anytime a character had a keyword and was attached to a unit, that unit then gained that keyword. <clears throat> and how do you attach a character to a unit? I'm sure it's probably, this is probably going to be the same. To attach a unit to a character, you simply place it in unit coherency and declare that that unit is now part of that model, that character is now part of that unit. So people would go through, and there was an ally system as well, they would go through and scrape through and try and pull as many keywords as they could and crush them into one unit. Um, the keywords that people were looking for was one, hit or run, hit and run, which allowed you to fall back out of combat and function without a penalty. Uh, Eternal Warrior, which allowed you to take a character that could take hits and not get hit and killed in one shot. Because at the time, weapons only did one damage on everything. There was no multiple damage. So in order to uh, circumvent this, you had some weapons that had instant death and others that if they doubled your toughness, then you would immediately die. People would target units that had a toughness of six because the game capped weapon strength at a 10. So this meant if you had a toughness of six or more, you could never be instant death, instant killed by your toughness being doubled. You would have to get hit with a weapon such as a librarian force weapon that could in fact do instant death. Now, if you have a turtle warrior, that doesn't even work. So this gave you your tank. Uh, one that I used was Lord Kalidor Drago with a two up, three up. He was able to shield and stop and protect my army. Then you're looking at feel no pain. Then Games Workshop later on decided to put Sisters back out there, and one of the units that they gave for Sisters of Battle not only was Celestine having hit and run, and she was a different model at the time, it was just her by, by herself, but you also had a unit called Ministrum Priest. Ministrum Priest allowed you to re-roll failed saving throws in close combat. So now you're looking at hitting a unit that you can only hit on sixes. Then that unit may probably will have a two-up save. They can re-roll failed saves for it. Maybe they'll be on their inbound, which guess what? They could re-roll that too. And then there's a feel no pain on top of it. And after you get through all those dice rolls, maybe, maybe you do a wound. Maybe you take out a model. Because the thing was, is that these Death Stars were being comprised of some insane combinations. Uh, and a couple of things that were common were one, um, there was these Tigeris. Tigeris was a librarian that he was allowed to, I'll pause for a second on this, you didn't pick your psychic powers, you had to roll for them on a chart. Invisibility was the number five on its table. Tigeris lets you re-roll this psychic chart and re-roll the psychic powers that he got, and he got three shots at it. So his probability of getting invisibility was extremely high. There was a Forge World character that some tournaments said no Forge World, some did. So Tigeris, though, was one that was guaranteed always able to be used. Uh, and so now there's your invisibility. And then you moved into uh, where did you get hit and run from? Dark Angels typically had Samael to do that. He would be able to give them hit and run. 
uh, out of my list, I was running Celestine. And then you would run something for Feel No Pain, some tough units that were able to be defensive. That would be your core anchor to attach everything to because you still needed a unit to attach it all to. Samael was a good tank. Drago was also an excellent tank. And then the last piece to it, Thunderwolf of Calvary with an Iron Priest on it. An Iron Priest was able to take four Cyber Wolves, and those four Cyber Wolves were considered to be war gear for him. So it didn't take away the fact that he was an independent character, which meant he could still be attached to that squad. Units like Drago had Gate of Infinity, so he could pick up his squad and teleport it, and deep strike it somewhere else on the field. And with all of those guys attached to it, you had basically three, because there was still Rule of Threes, three five-man squads attached to a character unit on top of whatever squad you decided to take, then all your characters. This was a large, large unit. Sometimes these units would be 20 to 25 models or more in one unit. So it literally was turning into all of your points into this one unit that you need sixes to hit it. Uh, and then it's got reroll and in bones for days. And if you do get through all of that, then you do one damage and it gets shrugged off and they just go, oh, okay. And nothing, nothing occurred from it. So with the state of the gate, with this unit that was just basically unkillable and a psychic power that made it unkillable and back and forth on <clears throat> ITC ruling, non-ITC ruling, what were we looking at for both of these? How was it going to be ruled at a tournament? It was a very, very dark time. It didn't get better because anyone who played in that edition knows that towards the end of the edition, they did more psychic powers and gave us more powers and gave us things like shifting worldscape and electro displacement. And I'm not even going to get into those things, but if those names alone probably will send chills down some players' spines. Uh, the way that this army would win is again, at seventh edition, we played to the end of the game on where you would score. And with variable game length being a thing where on turn five, you'd start rolling a dice to see if the game continued or not. Some TOs started to want to have things timed out better and would call it a hard stop on turn five. You're just games over turn five. That's it. So being able to see that, being able to know that there was very, very few armies that could handle death stars. And it wasn't even the way that you would like. Eldar had jet bikes that could steal objectives late in the game. So if an Eldar army went second, nine times out of 10, they could win the game just by doing nothing and hiding a couple units of jet bikes for the game. Uh, we then got Battle Company added to the mix, which is basically saying, okay, since you can't beat invisibility with a 1,500 or 2,000 point army, here, let's give you all your transports for free. So we're going to take a 2,000 point army, make it look like a 3,000 or 3,500 point army, and now you can fight against invisibility instead of toning down what it did. <clears throat> invisibility was what made it the worst. Everything else about it, all the defensive buffs and everything else could eventually be whittled down over time <clears throat> because you would want to start removing models. And if you removed all the units, for inf the infantry or units from the unit itself, the characters would break off. Characters could not character with each other and link together. So then you'd have to lose some extra guys, maybe a Ministrum Priest here, or take some damage on uh, your hit and run character, or lose some of the, um, the Cyber Wolves and weaken one of the TCAP breakoffs. And there it comes into how the list would win. You'd break those TCAP off, you'd break off different units, and you'd be able to go and take objective markers or take, um, take control of a table quarter if necessary. And the game would end and you'd win because you had a unit that your opponent couldn't kill. We talk about defensive play styles and be, having a non-interactive army like Necrons were in this edition with their objective secured list and being very non-interactive. This, this Necrons is nothing compared to what uh, Invisibility and Death Stars were in 7th edition. So now with that all being said, what does this mean now for the current state of 40k and what we're looking at? And is this, am I calling the harbinger with saying Death Stars are returning? The answer is no. So to wrap this up in the, to move through the history of 40k, both in 8th and 9th edition, we decided that characters were now not going to be able to be attached to units. This was the complete death of Death Stars. Death Stars were, you could take a big unit. You could spend a lot of points and take a really strong, tough unit, 
but it was never going to be a true Death Star because you could not attach these characters to it. Therefore, you couldn't give it the additional buffs and the buffs that you could put out onto them were still limited based on how the uh, how they were stacked. Uh, on top of it, you know, now with us adding core to the game, some of the bigger beastlier units may not have had core and couldn't get these abilities, even if you wanted. Uh, we do have some super resilient units in the game right now, a la Dark Angel Terminators. Uh, we saw Chaos Terminators for a while. They were really tough to kill, um, especially on their Dark Apostle abilities. So there has been some very, very tough units to eliminate and kill that could hold the board, but we haven't had a true Death Star where you put all your units, all your points into one unit because you could not attach characters to them. So that we haven't seen for a while. On top of that, one thing that I was saying a lot within how the game was played, now we're scoring over the course of the game. So having a single unit that is your entire army is not necessarily going to win you games. You can get tabled and still win a game because you outscored your opponent. And I think that's going to be <clears throat> the realm of what we see. There's two big factors to what we're about to see with the reattaching characters and the pos and Death Star's return to Warhammer 40k. Number one, invisibility isn't here. Please, oh please, oh please, Games Workshop, do not put out another broken psychic power like invisibility. I think we're okay because they've been paying a lot more attention to the game and, and <sighs> let's just hope invisibility, we never see something like that again. That was... I played it competitively, yes. It was horrendous. It made people want to quit the game because they would build these units, they buy these units, they make these cool armies, and they go, wow, I literally can't do anything with anything against your entire army because your entire army is one unit. So I don't think we're going to see that again. But now before that, Death Stars were niche. They didn't really win that much. Now, with a scoring over the course of the game, um, you know, board control is very important. De we Death Stars could come back, and I think that they are. I Once the index is hit, the first two units that I'm going to be looking at is Lich Guard and um, Paladins, and seeing what I can, what you can mix and match and attach in there. I definitely think the Death Stars are going to be back. We're going to see these big, all-encompassing units. However, that doesn't mean that they're going to be dominating the format, simply because of the fact that we score over the course of the game. A Death Star is going to have limited table coverage on how much it's going to be able to cover. You still have to maintain coherency. You're still going to have to hold those objectives. And although we don't have objectives secured in the game as much or at all anymore, you still are going to need to have enough models on that objective to take it. So one, it could bring units into the into line of sight that we didn't you didn't actually want to see get seen. And two, you might be able to take that objective from these stars based on higher OC counts. Uh, with that being said, though, Death Stars will add a fun, unique dynamic to some of these armies, such as Space Marines, Grey Knights, maybe even Custodes, where you're able to have a heroic character leading a unit, a very specific unit, into battle. And some of the buffs and upgrades you take may focus on that being a centralized force around this one unit. You'll have some of your strays and some of your helper units that can maybe go out and put up a banner or uh, take an objective marker or hold an objection objective. But without invisibility, without something that broken, it won't be as bad. The problem with Death Stars wasn't the fact that everybody was putting all their points into one unit. It was the problem that that one unit had one psychic power and its name was Invisibility. Now we just need to see a standard regular rule set. Uh, being able to have a Marine character at the forefront who has a, like the, uh, the Marine model that came out with the Relic Shield. He might be able to stand at the front of a unit and tank for them and take that damage. Now, that isn't to be said that there may be some armies that when their codex is hit off rip, we may see some overpowered, broken combinations 
with characters right off, right out the gate with their new codexes. But with Games Workshop being quick to answer back with FAQs and erratas, I think we'll. Uh, I, I think everything's going to get fixed fast enough that we shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Again, last thing, and I know I'm sounding like a broken record. The big pain was invisibility. All of the other stuff was manageable. There was times that I lost with these Death Stars, so it wasn't unbeatable. It was unfair. It made you have to play the game in a way that was not fun for your opponent. And honestly, playing it, yes, we were, I was playing competitive. Yes, there was a prize involved. So I brought the best of what I could bring and can't fault me for bringing the best of what I could to it. But at the end of the day, it did lead to a sour experience. Many players left Warhammer after this, after seeing that and it, from both sides of it, you know, and uh, it led to a lot of people having a lot of random models in their collection afterwards that they couldn't use anymore because of the way the ally system changed. I remember very much so. I had some T. I sold my T cab afterwards because I was like, I don't, don't need these guys anymore. I can't ally, and I wasn't going to play Space Wolves anytime soon. So I had other armies I was building. Uh, but now with allies kind of being away, you're going to be stuck within your codex for what you can do. But now we can see some really cool combinations. You know, I'm a big Necron player. I look forward to being able to uh, rebuild a royal court and put some characters in there. Have a score pack uh, lord with a unit of score packs and maybe attach some other characters on that bring a paladin brick with drago at the helm a librarian apothecary all that cool stuff these are going to be some cool cool units they're going to lead to a lot of very artistic conversions to be able to build these things some really awesome base work for their bases uh display boards everything just please games workshop do not put something in there as broken as invisibility was. The unit can be strong. The unit can be durable. It doesn't need to be invincible. That should have been the psychic power, not invisibility. Just call it invincibility. Guys, hopefully this was an informative video for you, and hopefully I haven't scared you too much. With characters being attached to units, it does alarm people and give some people a worry about these Death Stars. And I wanted to kind of bring, put this video together to kind of let everybody know that there was a reason that 7th edition put such a sour taste in people's mouth. And it wasn't necessarily the Death Stars. It was invisibility on the Death Stars. There was more to it. I'm sure there's going to be people in the comments section also will say, oh, well, there was also this, this, this. Yes, there was a lot of things. But when you look at it all, some of that stuff could be managed if invisibility didn't exist or the ITC ruling was used, which was now just sixes to hit, which meant template weapons could hit them, allowing some weapons to actually function against these. Uh, uh, one I remember that was very devastating was Wraith Guard Void Scythe, uh, D Scythes. That's what they're called. Necron, or Necron. <laughs> Got Necrons on the mind, man. Uh, but that was one weapon that Eldar was able to use that absolutely could shred a Death Star in seconds. If the ITC ruling was not in effect, then it was a useless gun because it was a template weapon, a flame template weapon specifically. Well, guys, I, like I said again, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and I'll talk to you guys again soon.